vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Now when the Jews heard that, they said, they did to Deborah the Well, that is the parable. I bet most of us know what Jesus is talking about, but it is important for us to reflect on the purpose of the parable and the message that it sends to the Jews, but especially, what does it mean for us today? And so in this parable, of course, God is the owner of the vineyard. The vineyard has been used to describe the nation of Israel throughout the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah chapter 5. There's no doubt that the vineyard refers to God's people, the nation of Israel. And so God wants them to give fruit, the fruit of obedience, the fruit of humility, the fruit of love, the fruit of a faithful response to what God requires of them. And so God sent the prophets, that's symbolized by the slaves. God sent the prophets to try to receive obedience from the Israelites. But they rejected the prophets. God sent them more prophets and they rejected those prophets. He sent them more prophets and they rejected those prophets. We've got some 16 prophets who left us writing to the Old Testament. But then finally, of course, God sent His Son. He sent His Son to the nation of Israel so that He could receive from them the obedience that was due to God. The nation of Israel was created for one purpose. And that was to bring Jesus into the world. If God is going to become flesh, then He's going to have a human mother. The mother is going to belong to a people. A people is defined by a law. And a people live on a land. It's hard to be a people if you don't have land to live on. And so when God called Abraham to leave his family, He said, Abraham, I'm going to make from you a nation. There's the people. Who's going to produce Joseph and Mary? But he says, under Moses, I'm going to give you a law, the law of Moses, that is going to define you as a people. It's going to especially keep you away from sin. It's going to keep you away from the non-believing peoples around you so that you can stay faithful to me, God says to Israel. And then under Joshua, God gives the Israelites a land, the land of Canaan, the promised land. Now, the plan was, and Isaiah especially is clear on this, the plan was that Israel would stay faithful to God. And then when Jesus came to the earth, then Israel would accept Jesus as the Son of God. They would accept Jesus as the Savior. And then they would be the missionaries, the first Christian missionaries. The nation of Israel as a whole. But Israel did not live up to God's expectations. Israel turned inward. They got to thinking, well, because I'm a descendant of Abraham, I've got my ticket to heaven. And when Jesus came, they rejected him. And in fact, not only that, but they, of course, also crucified him. And so Jesus brings up a passage from the very song that the Jews were singing when he came into Israel the day before, Jerusalem the day before, Psalms 118. Jesus looked at them, verse 17, and he said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected. This became the chief cornerstone. Over and over again, the New Testament writers point out to the Israelites that Jesus was promised in the Old Testament. And in fact, their rejection of Jesus was promised in the Old Testament. It was also promised in the Old Testament that Jesus would rise from the dead. And it was also promised in the Old Testament that Jesus would invite the non-Jewish people into his family. And so Jesus tells the Jews here at the end of this parable, verse 16, He will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyards to others. And again, Matthew, Mark rather, is clear. Because Jesus says God is going to give the kingdom, take the kingdom away from the Jews and give it to non-Jews. That the Bible calls Gentiles. And so God had always planned for all people to be saved through Jesus Christ, not just the Jews. And it is that that the, the Jews now 
now respond at the end of verse 16, may it never be. The original language here is what we have in the King James Version, God forbid. This is the absolute most powerful way that they can say no in the Greek language. God forbid. The Jews are saying, God forbid that God take the, the, the people, the ability to be the people of God, away from the Jews and give it to non-Jewish people. They could not believe that God would save somebody who was not a Jew. And so Jesus points out here from Psalms 118, verse 22, well, it's been promised in your scriptures down through the years that the stone that you reject, it's going to be the very cornerstone of the whole building. And by that, of course, he's referring to himself. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the foundation of his people, the church. And he says in verse 18, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But on him that red falls, it will scatter to his dust. In other words, just like Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews in his day, they could not understand how God would save man from his sins through the sacrifice of this man on the cross. They couldn't understand it. They thought it was foolishness to be saved by a man hanging on the cross. So today, you and I deal with people, co-workers, family members, friends, to stumble over the nature of this man, Jesus Christ. That's why they can't accept Jesus. He doesn't rise to their level of expectations. He's not the kind of Savior that they envision. They don't take him at his word. They have created a Jesus after their own image and their own likeness, and this Jesus doesn't measure up to just Jesus, and so they reject this Jesus. Well, what about you and me? What about you and I as members of Christ's New Testament church? What will we do with Jesus? Turn over to Romans chapter 9. Again, if you're using the Bible, you can use page 945. But in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, the Apostle Paul answers that question. What about the Jews today? Jesus tells a parable of the vine growers there. He says, I'm going to reject the Jews because they don't produce fruit, and I'm going to give the vineyard to the non-Jews, the Gentiles. Well, you and I are members of the vineyard today. I am the vine, you are the branch, as Jesus says in John chapter 15, and verse 1. And so we're members of the vineyard. What about us today? What will we do with Jesus? Let's read just a few passages here from Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Because in this passage, Paul tells us more about what Jesus meant through the parable of the vine growing. First of all, Romans chapter 9, verses 4, uh, 3 through 6. Paul is writing to the Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles in the church in Rome. And the Jewish Christians, no doubt, are responding, well, if God plans to save the Gentiles anyway, then what good is it, is it to be a Jew in the first place? And so Paul answers that question, verse 3. First of all, he says, I could wish myself a curse from Christ, separated from Christ, on behalf of my kinsmen who are in the flesh, my fellow Jews. In verses 4 through 6, 4 and 5, rather, Paul says, here's the advantage of being a Jew. The Jews are Israelites, to them belongs the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises. God appeared to the Jews. God appeared to King David. He appeared to King Solomon. Verse 5, who are the fathers, but from whom also came the cross. According to the flesh, he was overall God's flesh forever. Christians are not anti-Semitic. We have a Savior who is a Jew. And so in verse 6, Paul says, it is not as though the Word of God has failed. Just because God is not going to save the Jewish nation as a whole doesn't mean His plan has failed. Because, he says at the end of verse 6, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And he goes on to describe what he means by that. Those who are truly Israel are those who follow God from the hearts. It's not those who circumcise themselves in the flesh. It's not those who are physically circumcised. 
right? It's those who follow the faith of Abraham. That's the ones who are the true Jews. And so in our picture here, which actually comes from the picture uh, Paul gives in chapter 11, he says, let's look at the people of God as an olive tree. An olive tree. And its roots are in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus is the tree. His roots are in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in chapter 10, beginning in verse 16, he points out that the Jews are cut off from the tree. Remember our parable from Luke chapter 20? The Jews are cut off from the tree. Look at verse 16 of chapter 10. However, they did not all heed the good news talking about the Jews, because Isaiah said, The Lord who hath believed our report. And that's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 53 is that prediction of the crucifixion of Christ. And that, of course, is the big thing that the Jews could not accept. So who has believed our report? Verse 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, all that, surely they have never heard, have they? Yes, they have. It goes from Isaiah chapter 19. The voice has gone out into all the earth and all the worst things in the world. In other words, the Jews knew God's plan. God's plan to bring Gentiles into his family. God knew it all along, and their own Bible tells them that God knew it all along. Verse 19, I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? Yes, they did. He goes from Deuteronomy, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. So there's the promise that non-Jews would hear and obey the message of God from their own Bible. And so verse 20, Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not see me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. That's the Gentiles. As for Israel itself, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands for disobedient and obstinate people. That's why the Gentiles, the Jews, were cut off. That's why God took the vineyard out of their hands and he gave it to the Gentiles who could produce the fruit of obedience. One last passage here in chapter 11. The Jews are cut off, but he says in Romans chapter 11, the non-Jews are going to be grafted in. Let's read the passage from chapter 11, beginning in verse 7. If some of the branches were broken off, he's talking about the Jews now, you being the water of all, were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of a rich root of the olive tree. The promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But, he said, don't become anti-Semitic. Don't look down your nose at the Jews, he says. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are arrogant, remember that it is not you, the Gentiles, who supports the root, the Jews, but the root supports you. Our faith is rooted in the Jewish religion. But you will say that the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. What right? They were broken off for their unbelief. But you, Gentiles, stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches to Jews, He will not spare you Gentiles either. Behold me in the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fail through disobedience and unbelief, severity. But to you, the Gentiles, God's kindness, if, if you continue in His kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, talking again about the Jews, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And so the point here about the parable of the vine growers is that the Jews did not give God the fruit of obedience when God called for them. They did not respond to Jesus Christ in faith and obedience. And so God took the vineyard out of their hands and gave them to the Gentiles. Now, you and I are able to come to God through Jesus Christ. We can be members of the family of God through Jesus Christ. But Paul here in Romans chapter 11 tells us that if we are 